So let me introduce the main act for today, right? Um, for those who don't know Dr. Tio, um, he is passionate about uh, problems associated with the joint. He's um, looked at the close interrelationship between poor sleep, bruxism, TMD. Uh, he's learned a lot through um, Steve Olmos, who runs an amazing mini residency in this topic. Uh, I send Damien all my TMJ patients because at the end of the day, if I'm doing orthodontics, I want a stable jaw joint and uh, patients uh, uh, love him. Any questions? Everyone happy? All good? Sun is shining in Brunswick West. We're being rained upon in Sydney. Do you know we had like a... Yeah, I've got my staff start building an arc. Just <laughs> on the, um, just on the safe side. Yeah. Good. Damien, I'll hand over. Thanks, buddy, for doing this. No really worries. appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Derek. Okay. Yeah. Really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here in your amazing practice, lecturing for, your, um, for everyone here. So I'm going to be talking about a topic I'm very passionate about, sleep bruxism, and linking it between sleep medicine and dentistry, because it's that, that's something that we don't get taught a lot in university. We don't get taught about sleep medicine, or we don't get taught about sleep bruxism is actually related to sleep disorders. So just a little of my background. Um, I work here in Melbourne, and I only see patients for sleep medicine, TMD, and craniofacial pain. I work in um, Nidri, Footscray, and Armadale, and I don't work in a dental clinic. I work in a sleep physician clinic and a um, physiotherapy clinic, seeing all their TMD and sleep apnea patients. So this is my t um, the physio team I work with in Armadale. Um, we only see TMD patients, um, bruxism, and some sleep apnea. And this is the team I work with in uh, Footscray and Nidri. It's a team of sleep physicians. And I also have my colleague, Dr. Harrison Fu, another dentist like myself, um, who's very passionate about sleep medicine and uh, TMD. So <clears throat> the aims of today, going, there's going to be two different lectures. Uh, the first one, we'll be talking about um, defining, the, uh, defining bruxism, going through the differences between day and night bruxism, identify the causes of bruxism, uh, explain the link between sleep disorder breathing, TMD, and bruxism. And then the second part after the break, I'll go through how to manage bruxism cases in um, adults and kids and how I actually look at bruxism. And I'll go through a few different cases I've been treating as well. So when we look at bruxism, it's a very confusing topic because it's, we, when we see bruxism as dentists, we just think it's just one thing and it's a diagnosis. But the reality is bruxism is an umbrella term and it involves um, both awake and sleep bruxism and the pathophysiology, the causes and the treatments of awake and sleep bruxism are both very different. So when we look at awake bruxism, uh, that's defined as awareness of jaw clenching, mainly associated with a nervous tick and reactions to stress. The physiology and pathology is normally unknown um, because it's normally related with stress and anxiety issues. Now, day bruxism or wake bruxism, these are ones who they normally be clenching. They won't grind much, but they'll normally be clenching or bracing or thrusting their jaw during the daytime. And it's normally during periods of stress or uh, when they're concentrating. Um, common patients, um, common uh, times patients will tell me when they're clenching during the day is when they're at work or it's when they start look, defying it that there's actually a daytime and a nighttime bruxism. So that's something that we lost in the um, prosthodontic or dental part. And then they still say it's going to cause bracing, gnashing, grinding, etc. of the teeth. And then we look into sleep medicine definition. That's when it goes completely out of the, um, out of the park and goes in a different direction. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has actually um, had a classification, um, a definition for sleep bruxism since 2005. That's like almost 15 years ago, 15, 16, 17 years ago. <laughs> um, and they defined sleep bruxism as a sleep-related movement disorder. And before 2005, they classified it as a parasomnia, which was an undesirable behavior during sleep. So for all these years, even before I graduated from university, we always knew, or sleep doctors always knew, sleep bruxism was a sleep disorder. But in dentistry, we weren't taught it, or at least I wasn't in my uni. Um, and we only started learning about this when the sleep doctors or sleep medicine physicians start consulting with us. And um, in the sleep medicine definition, they say it's an oral activity characterized by grinding or clenching of the teeth during sleep, usually associated with sleep arousal. 
Now, I'll go back to what an arousal is, um, but that's probably why we didn't get taught about this definition in dentistry, because an arousal is a sleep medicine term, and basically what it means is it's an awakening or something disturbing or making us go from light, um, deep sleep to light sleep. So because there's this um, term of an arousal, it's probably why it's been lost to us in dentistry, because we're now going to a different field of medicine outside of our scope. And then they also define that the gold standard to diagnose sleep bruxism, not awake bruxism, but sleep bruxism, is by doing a PSG, which is a polysomnogram. That's just a fancy um, word to say sleep study. And, um, and it's a one-night study considered adequate for the diagnosis of moderate to high-frequency sleep bruxism. <clears throat> So since we know it's a sleep-related movement disorder, there's a number of sleep-related movement disorders that exist um, for us humans. So sleep bruxism has been related or associated with uh, restless leg syndrome, headaches, sleep breathing disorders, REM behavior disorders, and sleep epilepsy. And these are all conditions which can affect um, people's quality of sleep, their um, ability to get to sleep, um, their fatigue or wakefulness during the day. And this is only just a few sleep conditions. There's 10, 20 more um, sleep conditions that exist, which can also be related with sleep bruxism. So this was from a webinar I attended last year with Professor Frank Lobazuk, who's one of the world leading experts in uh, sleep medicine, dentistry, and bruxism. And he's actually just released a paper um, last year, which has a more updated definition of bruxism. And in his webinar, which I was attending, this is his update from last year. He says, that sleep bruxism is a masquetory muscle activity during sleep that is characterized as rhythmic um, or non-rhythmic. So when you look in sleep studies with a, um, doing sleep study, um, checking for bruxism, they'll talk about rhythmic activity or non-rhythmic activity. And rhythmic activity is more the sort of uh, grinding activity, and non-rhythmic or tonic activity is more of the clenching activity. And this, they, he says in sleep bruxism, it's not a movement or a sleep disorder in otherwise healthy individuals. So when you have people who clench or grind their teeth, they could either have something that's causing the clenching or grinding, or they could be completely healthy, and the clenching and grinding is just a normal habit that they're naturally doing. If we look at the awake bruxism um, definition, it's very similar um, to the sleep one. It's a masquetory muscle activity during wakefulness that is characterized by repetitive or sustained tooth contact and or by bracing or thrusting of the mandible and is, again, is not a movement disorder in healthy individuals. So when we see some of our patients who are clenching and grinding a lot and we see all their teeth wear, sometimes they're just doing it because it's a natural habit. It's something all of us always do. Just some people will do it more than others. And those are the ones we normally see with a, um, with a pathology of pain or headaches or broken teeth, etc. So um, looking in some of, uh, in this study from 2020, they're looking at the evidence um, that exists for sleep bruxism and what it's related to. And you can see with sleep obstruct, um, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, and periodic limb movement, uh, there's a very strong evidence with the relationship between bruxism. With insomnia, REM behavior disorders, and GERD, there's some evidence, but weak and strong. But I have seen myself personally Lots of patients who have, for instance, reflux or insomnia, um, and they're clenching and grinding their teeth a lot during the night. And this is um, a table from one of my sleep medicine textbooks, uh, where I was looking at sleep bruxism and looking at different <clears throat> relationships with different sleep disorders. So you can see it is, again, related with um, OSA, insomnia, different parasomnias, some sleep-related movement disorders, and other um, conditions such as epilepsy and myoclonus. <clears throat> So since sleep bruxism is not a movement disorder, um, we have to, oh, sorry, since sleep bruxism is not a dental condition and is a movement disorder, we have to recognize that just doing splints or um, crowns and build-ups isn't gonna fix everything. And if anything, it could sometimes make it worse or we may miss the underlying cause and not treat it properly. So when we look in sleep bruxism uh, with a sleep study, one of the things that they measure is RMMA. So RMMA is rhythmic masticatory muscle activity, which is basically just checking how the muscle, muscle of mastication, such as the masseters and temporalis, um, how much they're moving during the night. <clears throat> uh, now, with, in sleep bruxism patients, uh, or actually, sorry, 
when 60% of normal patients will have RMMA during sleep without any tooth contact. So these are people who, they'll be overworking their muscles, but the teeth won't be touching. So that's how we can sometimes see patients who complain of headaches or TMD, but we don't see any wear and tear on their teeth because they're just work, overworking their muscles, but the teeth aren't actually touching. And patients diagnosed with sleep bruxism, they have a greater frequency of RMMA and a greater amplitude. So they're basically moving their jaw muscles more frequently and with more force. So when we look into sleep bruxism, to make it even more complicated, we had awake bruxism, then sleep bruxism, and now in sleep bruxism, we have primary and secondary bruxism. So primary, sleep, um, primary bruxism is um, idiopathic, where we, there's no identifiable cause related with it. Um, and with secondary bruxism, that's when it's normally associated with a medical condition, such as OSA, insomnia, GERD, etc. So this was um, from a Facebook group, which I'm part of, a TMD sleep Facebook group um, run by Prof. Daniel Manfredini. Um, if you guys read the sleep bruxism and TMD literature, he's one of the, again, one of the leading um, world experts in sleep bruxism and TMD. And there's a paper I mentioned before that him and um, Prof. Lobosu um, co-wrote together. And he just wrote, um, it was just released when? January 2021, this was released. And he said um, in the summary here, sleep bruxism can occur alone or with comorbidities such as OSA, reflux, insomnia, headaches, orofacial pain, periodic limb movement, rapid eye movement disorders, and sleep epilepsy. And classically, the diagnosis of brux sleep bruxism is based on the patient's dental and medical history and clinical man manifestations. And if we want to go further, we can do like EMG electromyography, but they normally do that in um, research or complex cases. So basically, when you want to diagnose sleep bruxism, most of it can be um, assessed just through going through the patient history and looking at the signs and symptoms that you can see in the patient's mouth, where they've got like um, tooth wear, attrition, um, linear alba, skeleton of the tongue, tonsil, blocking the airways, etc. Now, um, this was, again, another article with um, looking at sleep medicine from Prof. Lobazoo. He says that finally, we should recognize that most risk factors for sleep bruxism, such as stress, smoking, caffeine, alcohol, and chronic orofacial pain, or TMD, these are all known risk factors for sleep disturbances and sleep disorders in sleep medicine. So basically, anything, uh, all these sort of um, stresses or risk factors for bruxism can also disturb our sleep. And they can also cause TMD or increase the risk of orofacial pain or TMD. So there's this huge overlap and link between the causes that we see in a sleep bruxism patient, a sleep apnea patient, and an orofacial pain or TMD patient, which is why whenever I see a TMD patient, I'm always thinking of the sleep. When I'm seeing a sleep apnea patient, I'm always thinking of the TMD at the same time. <clears throat> So when we're going through the different episodes of sleep bruxism, I saw mention about phasic and tonic before, and there's also mixed. So phasic um, episodes in sleep bruxism, that's when there's a rhythmic movement, which I said was more like um, the grinding movement, and tonic is the sustained movements. Um, and tonic movements normally tend to happen during an apnea because they're sort of sustaining and tensing their jaw muscles to help open the airway so they can breathe better. And then you can also have uh, mixed um, episodes where it's a combination of both tonic and phasic uh, episodes together. So when we're looking at the pathophysiology of bruxism and what could cause it, the possible causes from research in the second half of the 20th century involve, include uh, stress, anxiety, occlusal interferences, dopamine activity, airway obstructions, um, and allergies. And um, it is likely that the genesis um, of sleep bruxism cannot be explained by a single or simple mechanism. And that's what I normally find. I normally find most of the patients I see who are bruxing or clenching their teeth, they often will have a number of causes going on. Stress, anxiety, depression is normally one of the big things I see. But then there could also be medications, chronic pain, sometimes it's an allergy. I've seen some patients where just every time the season changes from summer to winter, they start clenching and grinding for the first two, few weeks of that seasonal change, and then it goes away. 
um, hormonal changes. So I've seen, uh, especially women, when they get pregnant or have their uh, menstrual cycle, they tend to sometimes clench and grind even more during those um, hormone changes. So this was um, Dr. Prof. Joe Levine, and this is his, one of his sleep medicine textbooks I, um, I refer to a lot. And in his textbook, he, has this air, he had this chart for looking at the risk indicators for bruxism. And, some of the, and he looks at the evidence that's out there and whether there's any evidence or good or strong or weak evidence. So one of the things that we've been um, focused on in dentistry with bruxism is we are, we're so obsessed that it's all related with the occlusion or related with interferences and things like that. But when we actually look into the research for it, the, um, the evidence showing that occlusion or the anatomy of our skull or interferences is actually very, very weak or it's absent. Um, and there's not very strong evidence to show that um, the occlusion or the anatomy of, anatomy of our skull and dentition is going to lead to bruxism. There are some who we can, but it's a very, very small subset. Then there's definitely growing evidence for psychosocial issues such as anxiety, stress, personality um, complexes, so especially with, uh, when ch with children, uh, an anxious or depressed adult will be, you know, very sad, mopey on antidepressants. An anxious or depressed child, they can be obsessive or they, have, uh, um, they could have a perfection complex where they have to get A plus and get perfect scores and everything in their grades. So the way we manifest um, anxiety, stress and personality between children and adults is very different. Um, the psychology and, bio, and psychology and biological um, indicators, there's growing evidence um, that traumatic injuries can cause clenching and grinding. And these are common in the TMD patients, people with chronic neck, back pain, or any other chronic injuries. Genetics, there's growing evidence showing that there's a genetic link. So if your parents clench or grind their teeth, there's a chance your kids could clench or grind their teeth. We know there's um, evidence with sleep disorders. Um, and then with different medications and drugs, alcohol, caffeine, and smoking, there's evidence as well. <clears throat> so how does sleep bruxism relate with OSA? That's probably something you're all wondering. So in this study, they um, had a, a group of people, a group of men actually, and they, were, they found that the master muscle gets activated when you increase the CO2 levels or when you induce hypercapnia in a person. And they found this is associated with obstructive breathing events. <clears throat> so they had a group of healthy males with no hypercapnia and no superficial muscle activity. And they induced hypercapnia in these people. And then when they induced hypercapnia, they found the masters were recruited by this breathing stimuli. And that in doing so, they had increased trismus in their master muscles. As they decreased the CO2, and the masters started to relax, and then they had less trismus. So in their conclusion from the study, they said that this data indicates that the master is activated by breathing stimuli that activate the genioglossus, which is the tongue. Earlier recruitment of the tongue suggests that activation of the masseter serves to stabilize the mandible and allow the tongue to function as a more efficient dilator of the upper airway. So to simplify that sentence, what we're saying is when we can't breathe properly, we um, recruit the master muscles to stabilize the mandible. And when we do that, the tongue then has more ability to protrude, to open and dilate our airway. And the brain recognizes all this whenever it starts choking or can't breathe properly. So, when we, we, when we go back to our um, definition from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, this is when we start looking into sleep arousals. So sleep arousals is, any, is an event that happens during the night which wakes us up or makes us go from a deeper stage of sleep to a lighter stage of sleep. And when I say waking up, it doesn't have to be physically waking up or being consciously awake. It can be tossing and turning, kicking the legs, or can even just be clenching and grinding the teeth. Clenching and grinding can be classified as an arousal episode in sleep. So an arousal is basically the activation of our sympathetic nervous system or activating the fight-flight response. And we should only activate the fight-flight response or the sympathetic nervous system when we're awake in a sense of danger. We shouldn't be doing it while we're asleep and relaxing. But if we are doing it while we're asleep or relaxing, something must be triggering this, um, this sympathetic arousal while we're asleep. 
So what could be triggering the sympathetic arousal? Well, um, as I said, it's a micro-awakening, going from deep sleep to lighter sleep. And when we have an arousal, it can be accompanied by, it's normally accompanied by muscle activity, increases in heart rate and breathing rate. Now, remember this blue box, because I'm going to touch on this in a later slide. And there's three different types of arousals. There's respiratory breathing arousals, periodic limb, uh, leg movements, and spontaneous arousals. And bruxism is associated with all three types of arousals. So if you have a breathing problem, you'll have an arousal. If you have a leg or limb movement, um, you'll have a, that's an arousal. Or you have a spontaneous movement, which is an arousal. So looking at uh, this study, they found a great majority of um, bruxism episodes in sleep are detected in non-REM or non-rapid eye movement sleep. And it's normally associated with, um, an, uh, with, a, uh, with the cyclic alternating pattern and always occurred during a transient arousal. So in sleep medicine, we've got rapid eye movement, REM sleep, and non-rapid eye movement sleep. And most bruxism actually occurs in uh, our N2 or NREM2 sleep. Um, very rarely, uh, there will be some bruxism that occurs during REM sleep, but not as common. And whenever there's any bruxism episodes occurring, especially in non-REM sleep, it's normally during a transient arousal activity. So when we look in this article, uh, which looks at linking sleep disorder breathing and TMD and bruxism, what they um, do is they define what actually happens in a sleep bruxism episode. So they firstly say a common sign of sleep disorder breathing is an arousal from sleep. And this normally happens after an, uh, an episode of airway obstruction or choking. Similarly, sleep bruxism is reported to occur within a micro arousal. So they're saying we have arousals during sleep apnea and we also have um, an arousal when we grind our teeth. In healthy young patients, when um, they found there's an increase in sympathetic activity eight minutes before bruxism occurs, um, and, or more, spe more specifically, uh, RMMA. Then they also described during this uh, bruxism event, they normally see two big breaths um, were observed, um, seeing that before the RMMA, and there was also a small but significant increase in blood pressure. So this is that blue box I spoke of before. There's muscle activity, heart rate increase, and breathing rate increase. What's that heart rate and breathing rate increase? That's the sympathetic nervous system activating because it's going fight flight response. It's trying to increase your heart rate and breathing so you can run away from a tiger. Or it's um, someone choking and having an apnea at night because go, <gasps> they can't breathe, heart rate increase because it's going, shit, I can't breathe, do something. So this is basically a diagram which explains what happens in sleep bruxism from start to finish. <clears throat> so just gonna look over here on the left. So about 60, sec 60 or more seconds before bruxism occurs, we'll have activation of the sympathetic nervous system or and decrease of the parasympathetic nervous system. So this is the fight flight response starting. About four, to four seconds to one second before we start clenching and grinding the teeth, there's increase in brain activity, heart rate, and breathing rate. That's the fight flight response occurring. When uh, bruxism finally starts, we have increase in muscle activity. And then what could also happen is there could be change in airway patency, there could be some jaw protrusion. And then three seconds into the bruxism event, we're getting more increase of EMG activity and RMMA. Then we may see tooth grinding where the teeth are actually touching. We may also see swallowing or sometimes even choking or gasping for air. And that's basically what happens from start to finish in a sleep bruxism episode during the night. And this is from Joe Levine's book, which explains a whole diagram in just another way. So look at the bottom here. About four minutes before the um, clenching or grinding episode starts, we've got increase in sympathetic dominance and decrease in, in parasympathetic dominance. We've got rise in brain activity because the fight flight response is um, starting up, rise in heart rate, rise in super high on muscle tone, two big breaths, you go, <gasps> which is the apnea, then you've got RMMA movement, and then uh, I've got teeth grinding. So that's basically what's going on from start to finish in a sleep, uh, in a sleep bruxism episode. So how I explain to patients is I show these CBCT images to, of the airway to help make a simple diagram to explain. I know people always say that a CBCT in upright awake patient is not 
um, indicative of someone who's asleep lying supine, but I don't care. I'm just using this to explain to a patient so they can understand how they could be grinding at night and how it could be related to sleep apnea. So basically, we've got, as you all should know what a CBCT looks like, uh, but if you don't, here's a, this is the side sagittal view. We've got um, the airway oropharynx, um, the um, pharyngeal airway at the back, and from top down view, you can see here's the pharyngeal airway here, and this is someone with a very good big airway. Then you have someone like this, you have a very small airway. Now, someone like this, obviously, is going to have much more high risk of having sleep apnea, especially if they lie supine on their back. Now, if this person were to lie down and go to sleep, this area, the bottom jaw and tongue and um, um, soft palate, can all collapse backwards and block that airway, so then they can't breathe. If they can't breathe, they'll start snoring or choking, which is sleep apnea. Then the brain panics and says, hey, I can't breathe. Do something so I can breathe better. So it tells the, bottom, tells the brain to activate the jaw muscles to thrust or push the jaw and tongue forward or tense the muscles to help open this airway so it can breathe better. And this is how people with sleep apnea or snoring can start clenching and growing their teeth. So teeth grinding during sleep is most likely secondary to breathe activation of the primitive brain, which is our autonomic nervous system, um, which also incorporates cardiac and respiratory systems. So sleep bruxism is all a neurological event. It's all coming from the brain. The cause of it is from our brain being activated. The cause is not from a high, well, sometimes it can be a high feeling, but it's not always from the anatomy or always from um, stress or medications or GERD or OSA. What stress, GERD, OSA, medications, what they all do is they stimulate the central nervous system and they overactivate it, which then causes a neurological event, which then causes sleep bruxism. So they've done different studies to look into different arousals which can cause um, sleep bruxism. So in, uh, in this study, they just had people who were asleep and they flashed light on their face. The light stimulates an arousal and because they were getting um, an arousal, not a breathing arousal, but just some sort of spontaneous arousal, they started clenching and grinding their teeth. So when we're going back to our prosthodontic or dental definition of bruxism, we're all obsessed with well, it's going to lead to occlusal trauma or breaking the teeth. But in reality, we have to think, what if it isn't a parafunction? What if it's um, actually a protective function? So we're all obsessed that bruxism is bad for us. No one should be clenching or grinding. We shouldn't be doing it because we'll hurt our jaw or break our teeth. But reality is, as I've just explained, sleep bruxism is the brain's warning system or the brain's activation of our muscles to help us breathe better. So it's actually protecting us. And that's what the flight, flight response is. The flight, res flight response is something all of us have to protect us to, out of danger. And if the brain is being activated, gets out of danger, it's actually a preventive or protective mechanism. So we have to ask, is Bruxism actually our friend or is it our foe? And this is um, going through a few slides uh, from Prof. Lobsey's webinar I attended last year, where he introduced this concept that to, uh, to me that made me real realize that Bruxism isn't always bad. It's actually a good thing for some people. So we know it, um, with Bruxism, the consequences of it, they can be either risk, factor, um, risk factors or bad consequences or protective factors, which are good consequences. And the bad um, risk factors are the teeth wear, TMD, clicking jaw joints, etc. Whereas with the protective factors, one thing that we've recovered is um, opening or dilating the airway so we can breathe better. Um, but the other protective factor that Prof. Lobsey has been researching and looking into a lot is prevention of cognitive decline or increase of um, brain activity to help us get um, to concentrate and do certain tasks. So in this, um, in this slide, Dr. Lobsey was talking about um, a study that they did on animals. So they had a, had a group of mice. And what they did was they had the mice go through this water maze. So it was basically like a tank of water. And they had to get through the, to the maze to get to this uh, platform. And in the group of mice, which, they had, which were all normal, the mice could easily go through the maze. Then with the same group of mice, what they did was they introduced bruxism into the mice. And how they did that is they either took some of their teeth out, or they reduced their vertical dimension, um, or they stimulated bruxism in these mice. And, Oh, no, not so no, they, they, um, they reduced the mice's ability to chew or clench or grind their teeth. 
And they did that by removing their teeth or grinding down their teeth. And once they did that, the mice had a lot more difficulty completing the same maze that they just did a little while ago. And then what they then found is when they restored the, mice, um, the mice's ability to chew and grind again, they were able to complete the maze again. So they, um, he, they proposed that the loss of mastication or clenching or grinding can lead to cognitive impairment. And this is more vulnerable in older people. And this can be reversible if we restore their occlusion or if we get them uh, able to be able to eat and chew and clench and grind properly again. He also did another study on humans. Now, in humans, it's, un it's not ethical to take the teeth out or grind out the teeth for no reason. So instead of grinding out the teeth or taking them out, what they did, they had um, some healthy, um, healthy older people and they had some older people with dementia. And they gave them this chewing gum. And with this chewing gum, it's, um, half of it was red and half of it was blue. And they got these people to chew on the gum and they measured how well they could um, chew or clench or grind their teeth by how much the gum got mixed up. So in the healthy individuals with no dementia, they were able to chew it very well and really mix up the gum. Whereas those with dementia, they had very poor chewing capabilities and you can see they barely chewed up the gum. <clears throat> so from that study, what they concluded was jaw muscle activity is positively associated with cognition as demonstrated for chewing. And he says there's likely need to be more research in this field, but he's also seen in, um, in like elite athletes or footballers, or um, he often finds that they t tend to be chewing gum or when we're stressed or focusing for exams or work or anything, the reason why we tend to clench and grind our teeth, his theory for the reason why we tend to clench and grind when we're focusing on something really strenuous is because we're trying to increase the blood flow and oxygen perfusion up to our brain. So by activating our jaw muscles, we're increasing the blood flow up here so we can t um, take on these highly arduous tasks. So we have to still think, what is the cause of bruxism? I've talked to you all about arousal, sleep apnea, but it's still quite confusing about what could be the cause. And if I had to sum it all up in one word, oh, actually, before I get to that, <laughs> um, Prof. Lobazu, he goes that with the etiology of bruxism, um, in the past, we're all focused on peripheral factors such as our morphology, anatomy, and occlusion. But nowadays, in the later half of the 20th century, we're now focusing more on the central factors or factors which can um, stimulate or activate our sympathetic nervous system. And this includes our biological factors such as neurochemicals or our genetics, psychosocial factors such as stress and personality issues, and exogenous factors such as medications and smoking. So looking at the peripheral factors, they do play a role and they can cause bruxism, uh, but it's a very small role and it's not as common as the central, um, the central factors. So the central factors is the central nervous system being activated and that's often the sleep arousals, um, or activation of um, CNS by various neurotransmitters such as serotonin, amino gamma, butyric acid, and um, I can't pronounce that. <laughs> so if I, when I talk to my patients about how to, sum, uh, how to easily sum up what causes bruxism, I like to just use the word stress. But I extrapolate the word stress. Everyone just thinks stress is being stressed about exams or work or a divorce or something like that. But stress can mean a lot of different things. And I see stress as anything that stimulates or activates our sympathetic nervous system. So there's this book from um, Dr. Um, Emmer and Meyer. He's a medical doctor from the States. He's a gastroenterologist. And he looks at, um, he researches and lectures a lot about um, gut health and how it influences our psychology and stress and chronic pain in the body. And in his book, he defines stress as um, your brain perceives many bodily events as stressful, which can include infections, surgeries, accidents, food poisoning, sleep deficits, attempts to stop smoking, or even something natural as a woman's menstrual cycle. So whenever I ask my patients, um, or talk, ask my patients about their medical or social history, they normally tell me things about like, their work life, their family life, um, and off, most of the time they say, nah, I'm not stressed. But then I'll go through their history and I'm like, oh, well, you, you're a lawyer, you're very, you have a very stressful job, um, you've got all these things going on at home, you have three kids, you have to run from point A to B to C to pick up all your kids. 
They might not feel it's stressful, but just having all these different stimuli going on is enough to stimulate the brain to think, shit, I can't handle all this. And then if you throw in things such as TMD or chronic pain or um, a toothache or something, that's also another stress which will stimulate them to cl clench and grind their teeth. So basically, I show this slide to all my patients. It just helps them understand that anything besides just mental anxiety, stress, etc., can cause them to clench or grind their teeth. So now let's think about children. We talk, most of everything I've talked about falls for both children and adults. But when we look at children, it can, there's a few subtle differences between them and adults. So um, when we look at the prevalence of bruxism in kids, the prevalence is very wide, and it can um, vary between 3.5 to 40%. Uh, and the prevalence of sleep bruxism in, and whereas another um, article says that the prevalence of sleep bruxism in children could be twice as high as adults. So with the causes of bruxism in children, it's quite different because the neurology of children is much different from the neurology of adults. And that's when we look in sleep medicine, we see sleep, um, sleep studies for children is much different from sleep studies of adults. And normally if you have a child um, who has sleep bruxism or a sleep disorder and you want to get a sleep study for a child, you have to go through a pediatric sleep physician. Normally, their adult sleep physician will say, no, nope, I can't handle it. You need to see a specialized um, pediatric sleep physician because sleep, um, children's sleep is much different from adult sleep. And some of the causes of bruxism in, in kids can be the maturation or natural growth of their CNS. Uh, the personality profiles, as I was mentioning before, um, they could have a high... Um, they could um, display high levels of responsibility or neuroticism, such as anxiety, worry, fear, anger, frustration, depression, envy, loneliness, um, and psychological or social factors. The airways, most of us may already be looking at tonsils, adenoids, and things like that already. Sleep disturbances, genetics, though we haven't been able to pinpoint the exact genes yet. And males often tend to clench more in children, which is... Funny, because I normally find in adults, it's the opposite. It's normally women who are clenching more. So this is a um, slide that, um, that I um, got from Dr. Amanda Poon Nguyen um, from her Facebook, free Facebook group, uh, Spoonful Oral Medicine. She's an oral medicine specialist in UWA, and this was a, she was happy to share this slide with me. Um, there's lots of connective tissue disorders or um, um, hereditary disorders that children could have which also cause clenching and grinding, such as obesity, trisomy 21, cerebral palsy, um, Ella Danlos syndrome, etc. And Dr. David McIntosh, an ENT that some of you may know, who works very closely with lots of dentists, um, not very scientific, but he posted on Facebook that just from his anecdotal um, observations of working with lots of dentists and seeing lots of kids with clenching and grinding, he finds that the most likely causes of clenching and grinding in children is often the airway, low iron, which is something I see a lot in adults, with, especially if you've got TMD or sleep issues, they will have low iron or low magnesium or low vitamin D, which all impact on their ability to sleep or feel um, refreshed in the morning. They could have tongue ties, intestinal parasites, or psychological issues. Uh, so this study was looking at the improvement of bruxism after doing tonsil and adenoid surgery. And they found there was a positive correlation between sleep disorder breathing and bruxism. And there was an important improvement of bruxism after removing the tonsils and adenoids. So in other words, they're removing any obstructions, which then made it much easier for a kid to breathe, which then stopped or reduced their bruxism. In this other study, um, they were looking at um, whether that teeth wear um, as an indicator for sleep, uh, for sleep apnea in children. So they say that um, sleep bruxism tooth wear can be indicated for sleep disorder breathing, um, as it is strongly associated with the RDI, which is a term we use in sleep apnea diagnosis. And in the absence of obstructive sleep apnea, there can be tooth wear. Tooth wear may be an indicator for upper airway resistance syndrome. So upper airway resistance syndrome leads to sleep apnea. Now, sleep bruxism tooth wear by itself is not a risk indicator, indicator for sleep disorder breathing. So if you see any kids who are clenching and grinding their teeth, it doesn't always mean they have a sleep breathing disorder. They could have any of those other causes I mentioned or any of those um, disorders that um, Dr. Amanda Foon had on her slide. Um, but we can use 
tooth wear in kids in combination with other signs and symptoms to make it easy to identify that, hey, they could have sleep disorder breathing or they could have some other underlying medical or stress issue going on. So when we're managing Bruxham and children, the first thing I'm always looking for is looking at the airway, looking for if they snore, seeing if they have any tonsil adenoids or nose issues or ear issues. Um, often, to manage them, I'd refer to an ENT. Most of the time, I'd refer to an ENT before a sleep physician because, as I said before, you normally need a pediatric sleep physician, and in Melbourne, there's only a handful of them compared to adult sleep physicians, so the wait time can be long or it could be just difficult to get into them. And also, doing a sleep study for children can sometimes be difficult because there's always wires. Sometimes with adults, it's difficult already. Uh, but a sleep study is something I do refer some children for because we just need it because they may not have sleep apnea. And how we could also manage um, Bruxham in children could be orthodontic expansion or um, helping with any malocclusions. Because whenever we see malocclusions, especially in kids, I'm always thinking, is there an airway issue going on which could have caused this malocclusion? So this was a study where, um, which Dr. Mahoney was actually part of. Um, and, he, and they were looking at the tonsil adenoids in kids. And I found that tonsil adenoids are normally small at birth, and they gradually increase in size until about seven or eight years old. And then they, be they begin to shrink in size to about 10 or 11 years old. And the reason why this slide is important is quite a lot of G GPs or ENTs who don't look into this stuff a lot, they'll say, oh, your kid has large adenoids and tonsils, uh, but they're going to grow out of it. Let's just wait until they're 10 or 11 years old, and they'll be fine. But if the kid is two years old with large tonsil adenoids and they're clenching and grinding, having poor sleep, if we're going to let them wait another eight to nine years for them to get better, that's really going to affect their growth, really going to affect their mental development, their education, their performance at school, etc. So whenever we see any airway obstruction with kids, we need to make sure we get assessed properly and work with a proper team of ENTs or sleep physicians who actually see the importance of gaining early and doing early intervention. So when we manage sleep drugs in kids, as I mentioned before, a sleep study can be so helpful because not all um, kids with sleep bruxism will have sleep apnea or um, a breathing disorder. Um, and I, as I mentioned before, it can be tricky to sometimes get a pediatric sleep, um, sleep, sleep study in Melbourne or in Australia, but it is very useful. And some kids that may not have sleep disorder or OSA, they could have reflux, which could mimic choking at the night, or they could have any other sleep disorder where orthodontic expansion or taking out tonsil adenoids may not fix it. They could have um, insomnia or REM behavior disorders or epilepsy, etc. So another thing with sleep bruxism in kids is it may be just their natural growth. It may be just their CNS or their nervous system developing. And if that's the case and there's no signs or symptoms or big wear or tear or pain or anything, the bruxism is just normal. We can just leave them and let them grow. It's something just, that's just naturally happening because um, their brain is maturing. Sure, if they are breaking down their teeth or something, we might need to do some fillings or um, stainless steel crowns, or you could potentially make um, a splint for them and just change it every few months or things like that. But some kids, there's nothing um, actually going on which is causing bruxism. It's just their brain maturing and them growing and developing. So as long as you've screened any other um, risk factors, it can be fine, just leave it and just make sure their teeth don't break down into the pulp. So as I said before, when I see malocclusions in um, children, I'm not just thinking, oh, they've got crooked teeth or underbite or something. I'm also thinking, do they have an airway issue? And the thing is with kids, sometimes they'll have no tonsil adenoid issues um, or no obstructions, and, but they will be snoring. And when the ENT has a look, they'll be saying, oh yeah, their airway is fine, there's nothing blocking the airway. But the ENT isn't trained to look at dental malocclusions. And we may see a kid who has a huge deep bite or overbite, and they may have no airway blockages, but the deep bite is probably an uh, airway blockage because it's obstructing the airway with the mandible being backwards. So whenever I see any sort of malocclusion, I'm always questioning whether they have a breathing disorder, um, or whether they have a breathing disorder, or just difficulty breathing because of the size and shape of their skull or mandible uh, and max maxilla. <laughs> So this was a, um, a kid I saw many years ago, came into us for a consult regarding um, bruxism and breathing issues. And as you can see, she's got a very narrow high arch palate, crowding, not, not enough space for her um, laterals. 
um, and built cross bites here and there. And we looked down her throat, she's got a very good throat and airway, so we can actually see down the back of her throat, her tonsils aren't blocking the airway. Um, and what we then did to plan the orthodontic component was we did a CBCT, and then we saw a CBCT showed her nose and sinus were completely blocked. And that was like, oh well, well, that explains why she's not breathing properly at night. Her oral airway is all fine, but her nose and sinus are completely stuffed up. So we sent, and the thing is, she had already seen an ENT before, and the ENT said, nah, she's fine, her nose and sinuses don't need any treatment. We showed her the scan, and then the ENT was like, oh, okay, I guess I should do something. Because <laughs> what's going on here, this is something, I showed this, I showed this scan to Dr. McIntosh um, back then. And he was like, yeah, you need to do something ASAP for this kid, see another ENT, or show the scan to that ENT. Um, because what can happen is when kids have their sinuses completely full like this, um, the, sinus, um, the, can, the sinus membrane between the eyeball can perforate and break, and that can be called, that's called sin silent sinus syndrome. And that's when the eyeball can drop down into a maxillary sinus because this area has become perforated. So Dr. McIntosh was like, yeah, get this guy into surgery ASAP because we don't want him to get um, silent sinus syndrome. So to summarize all that, basically sleep bruxism is a sleep-related movement disorder. It's um, related with a fight-flight response, which is related to our CNS and our autonomic nervous system. It's normally um, secondary to an underlying cause. The exact cause is unknown, but it's normally multifactorial. As, a, as I said, I like to just summarize it with stress. Um, it's normally centrally driven. Splints might not address the main cause because if we just realize if there's um, stress, anxiety, or airway issues, a splint isn't gonna help any of that. Um, bruxism could be a protective function, not just a para function. And sleep disorder, breathing, TMD, and bruxism can be linked together. And the reality is everyone grinds. We cannot stop bruxism, but we can manage it, and we can manage the causes leading towards it. So thank you all for your time. If you all want to learn more from me, feel free to join my free Facebook group. And um, I'm always happy to answer emails or Facebook messages if you have any questions or concerns. Um, and later this year, I am also holding um, a TMD and sleep mini residency where um, Derek will be joining as well. And also got Dr. Donnie Mandrawa here, <laughs> who'll be joining us. So we've got a team of different experts all look, talking about the field of TMD, sleep apnea, um, and bruxism. And as you can see, it's a multidisciplinary field. There's only so much we can do as dentists. So that's why we have Derek talking about orthodontics. We've got Dr. Lewis Chan from Sydney, who's a t dentist who also does acupuncture. Uh, I've got my ENT, Nathan Hayward, um, Roland Barrowman, an amazing MaxPak surgeon here in Melbourne. So if you have any TMD or orthognathic surgery cases, um, me and Derek both work with Roland on very complex cases. We've got Dr. Stephen Bender. He's a or, um, diplomat of orofacial pain from the United States. He's going to be giving a lecture on headaches and neuropathic pain. Donnie here is going to be talking about my functional um, therapy. Uh, I've got Do Darren Gorowski, my TMJ physio, who works with me. Um, Jacob, who's my lab guy, who does all my splints. And we've got my TMJ osteopath, Christina Fravel, and my um, chiropractor, Steve Shashian. And basically, we, it's a very hands-on course. It's not just um, lectures. We had lots of practicals with my physio team coming in to teach us how to um, palpate joints, unlock joints, um, manually manipulate um, muscles and release them. Um, so it was very interactive, and we all got our hands dirty doing that. Um, and then we had some demonstrations as well from my um, chiro and osteo showing like, breathing retraining, different techniques and things we can assess from a body perspective. Because lots of these patients, the reality is, they won't have many dental signs and symptoms. They'll have lots of bodily signs and symptoms that we can recognize the minute they walk into the room. So thank you all for your time. I'm, we're going to have a bit of a break, I believe, now. And then I'm going to go through another lecture where I'll be talking about how to manage bruxism more in adults and how I actually manage bruxism. And then I'll go through a few case presentations of some patients I've treated. Thank you. I'm happy to answer some questions now if there's any. Any questions? <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Cho, and hi, everyone. 
Um, I don't know. My question might be a bit silly, but no, it's okay. It's never a silly question. More in the next session, but the question is, as you said, that grinding can or parafunction can be beneficial in some health-wise to the patient, right? Mm. So if if we're making splints for the patient, does that obstruct that benefit to the patient? It can, yeah, and I will touch it more in the next part, but short answer, yes, splints can, which is why before we just make splints, it's very important to first recognize whether there's any other underlying disorders, such as sleep apnea or snoring, and hopefully from this lecture, you all start thinking, when I see a Bruxelles patient, before I just told him you need a splint, or maybe look at a sleep study, or asking some questions about their sleep or breathing, asking about their stress or their family, social, work history, etc. Yeah, so actually, uh, I saw a patient yesterday, he's a lawyer, huge stress head, um, and he told me that he's been clenching and grinding for the last six months for the first time ever, and he's getting all this jaw pain. Then um, during Christmas, he went on holiday, had no headaches or pain at all for that whole month. Then when he came back on holiday, went back to work, pain came back. So for me, I was like thinking, okay, I don't think I'll make him a splint because his pain went away by itself when he was not stressed. I could make him a splint, which might work, but at the same time, it might not. Um, it might make things worse, or he might just think, oh, I've just spent money on something which is still the same, and when I'm on holiday, I'm all fine. So I sent him to a um, pain psychologist to have a look at that, and if that doesn't work out, then I will make him a splint. Mm. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, can you Oh, hi, Theo. Um, my question is, um, so you say you work with chiros and osteos. Mm -hmm. So how do you pick between all these um, kind of feel like there's physio, chiro, osteos, like, yeah. Tricky question to answer because one, it depends on the skill level of the, um, the, practi of the physio, chiro, osteo. Um, so the physio, chiro, and osteos that I refer to and have lecture with me, they're ones I personally know. Um, and people I've actually observed and watch them treat, or they've treated me myself. And sometimes I just go into it and say, can you do some treatment on me? I just want to see what it's like. So then I have an understanding and, and can I sort of, sort of um, see if they're the correct person for my patients. And then, so one, it's the skill level of the people that you're referring to. And then it's, the next is the presentation of the patient. And that's a difficult thing to just explain in an hour or even in a lecture because every patient presents with different presentations. They have lots of different histories, different injuries, um, different pains and things like that. So some people, majority I find physio is great for lots of the soft tissue work when there's neurological or um, joint issues, um, especially with the uh, facet joints. That's when I normally go into the chiropractors and chiropractors are very great with neurology especially. Um, osteopaths, I'm normally using cranial osteopaths because not all osteopaths work with the cranials. And the cranials is the cranial sutures, which is where our orthodontic movement and expansion really becomes important, um, especially with children with tongue ties and things like that. So cranial osteopaths, they can actually work with the cranial sutures and help them move properly and grow and develop. And adults, um, lots of adults who have headaches or jaw pain, it's because their cranial sutures are jammed together or not moving or flexing properly. That's something that um, physios don't get trained in. Some chiropractors are trained in, uh, but chiropractors as well, chiropractors spend maybe 15 minutes in their appointments because that's normally all they need. Whereas an uh, osteo or a physio, they spend maybe half an hour to an hour in their appointments because they're doing different stuff and they need more time to do it. So it really depends on the skill of the practitioner, what sort of signs and symptoms you see in the patients, and what sort of um, relief you're trying to get. Is it a headache relief or a locked jaw or is it reducing stress and things like that? Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Hey, are, are you? Oh, I'm, I'm done, yeah. <laughs> you got a break. Oh, yeah, this is a break now, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, sorry, I won't take up your time, just a few minutes. Um, look, I mean, um, I'm just going to give it to you straight. Uh, like, I'm a biochemist. Um, don't really know much about sales, so uh, don't think of this as a sales pitch. Um, 2015, prior to that, our company, NCAA and Z, and we correlate with another company called NCA Laboratories. We used to set up research laboratories. That's, what, that's the nature of our business. We set up cancer research facilities 
analytical chemical laboratories and institutions such as the universities. Um, and then we also set up hospitals as well, hospital laboratories, and we sort of crossed over into hospital theatres. And around 2015 in Sydney, for those of you who, from, who are from Sydney, there was an incident that happened in July 2015. Um, there was a, an organisation called a Gentle Dentist, a Gentle Dental Company. I don't know if you know anything about it, but there was a huge national uh, um, breach of infection control in that year. And there was a possibility of 44,000 patients infected. And no one understands really how it happened. There was some speculation here and there. But I wanted to ask the question, why did this happen? Maybe negligence on the part of the dentist. That's quite possible. But how can you have a breach of infection control? Don't we have these things sorted? And where are we getting our information from? So there is one major factor why your practice is doing something different than the practice down the road, than another person's practice in Sydney, than Queensland. Why aren't we unified in the same way that we're pushing our infection control on our practices. Well, the reason is because there is a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation between the scientific Australian, European and international standards compared to your, what your guidelines are. Some people live and die by the guidelines, but the guidelines are written by who? Biochemists? Microbiologists? Physicists? So, that would be like me saying to you, I'll hand you all a big 2,000 page law textbook and I'll hand you a pen and a piece of paper. And I'll say, turn to page 556. Write down on that piece of paper your best interpretation of that page. Every one of you will send me back something different than the person sitting behind you or sitting next to you. That's interpretation and that's what's happened, unfortunately, in your dental community. The scientific standards have been not entirely, but largely misunderstood from the scientific way of running your practice to prevent breach of infection to the people that wrote your guidelines. Like I said, I'm going to give it to you straight. This is what's happened. That's the reason why you have breaches in practices. Does anyone even know the name of your Australian standard? Some of you might know it. ASNZ, what do you think that stands for? Australia, New Zealand. 4815, the number of the standard. 2006 hasn't changed since. So your scientific methods have been written 15 years ago, but yet you still see updates in guidelines. That, why is there, keep, didn't they get it right back in 2006, 2007? So, uh, when I'm here, I'm working obviously with Derek as well. I've set up Derek's practices. And we have been on the back end of practices who ring us up for the last 10 years when something like that happens. A patient comes in. I'm not saying every patient is complaining about a breach of infection control. It could be something like, I didn't like the way the receptionist treated me. I tripped over the step on the way out. Um, the floors were dirty. I think these, are all, these happen all the time. Do you know how many times this happens every year in Australia in dentistry? 15,000 times a year. So we're on the back end of that. We're taking calls. We're reacting to those calls. So now, because it's blown through the roof and we've been knocking down the doors of these authorities trying to say, listen, here's the information you need. Now go and tell your associated dentists around Australia. Tell them or in your state. Oh, no, we've got this one sorted. We'll just leave that. OK, well, then, then you have to explain why we have 15,000 incidents every year. So, Instead of being reactive, we're now being proactive. So we're coming to you and we're saying to you, we're providing an audit for your practice. You don't have to do anything. We'll do everything for you. Uh, what we do is we have to rewrite all of your policies, procedures, your manuals. It takes several weeks to do it. And it's a very daunting job. But just know in the end, those documents that we write for you will be enough to do one accreditation after the next, after the next, after the next. You don't need to redo anything. Just hand the documents to the QIP accreditation body. They will accredit you. Pay the fee. Right? If you do have a complaint in the practice and it goes down the path of breach of infection control, those documents are all you need because those documents are written to the ISO international standards, which dictate to the European standards, which dictate to the Australian standards. 
and on the bottom are your guidelines. So why won't we just go straight to the top and we'll come in as scientists and we'll completely rig out your entire facility. You won't even know what's going on. You'll be seeing patients as normal. We'll do everything in the background. And the final thing we do is we train all your staff and certify all your staff as competent for everything that they do. The processes by switching to the international standards reduces your labor in terms of your nurses not spending half the day in the sterilizing area, that they, they are freed up to do other things because most of the things people are doing is overkill and most of the things people are doing inside the sterilizing area doesn't really mean much because it's most of the stuff that they do doesn't provide much evidence and not many people know that. So we're going to eliminate stuff like that, put the proper procedures in there, reduce the labor and take away most of those products that you're using because you don't even need them. Half the stuff you need, you don't, you don't even need that stuff. So your whole cost over, say, 12 months will come right down. So that's why I'm here. We have a, ta I, I have a table outside there. Um, and I have, it's very easy. I've got a document that explains everything. It's got my business card and a nice little NCA pen. Uh, if you'd like to just take one and then have a read of it when you go home or over the weekend or on your flight back to where you're going, that's all I can ask. So I, I appreciate your time. And um, any questions, um, my card's out there. You can, you can speak to me and I'll be here for a few more hours. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.